everyone, I'm Antonia Lafaso. Welcome to my house. I'm so excited for this cook along with you guys. We are doing the Feast of Seven Fish, which is basically this bounty of fish on Christmas Eve. It's an Italian American tradition that I absolutely love. We're making crispy squash flowers with crab and tarragon and ricotta and chives and lemon zest. This is definitely a dish that has evolved over time for me. Um, it's not a dish that my mom used to make, but since I became a chef, this is what I've brought to the mix. So we have a couple of housekeeping tips that we need to go over before we start cooking. Number one, I wanna make sure that you have all of your ingredients, okay? You have a Dutch oven on that has oil in it of your choice. I prefer peanut oil, but any kind of canola oil or vegetable oil for frying will do. And just make sure that you have an oil thermometer in there so that we can regulate the temperature at 350. And if you have ricotta, you don't, not if you have ricotta, you should. Um, your ricotta, if there seems to be like a lot of water in the container, let's make sure we drain that. So drum roll please, we're gonna start this cooking. We're gonna start by making the filling for the squash flour because it needs to go into the refrigerator to rest and then we will start on the batter which is essentially just a tempura batter, very, very easy and straightforward. All right, so let's start with the filling. We're gonna start with a little bit of garlic and shallots in a pan and we're gonna let those just sweat and then we're gonna add that to ricotta, a little bit of mascarpone cheese, the crab and all of the herbs. So I have some butter that I'm gonna start to just very gently, slowly start to melt in a pan. I don't want it to, I don't want it to brown, I don't want it to cook, I just want it to melt. And while that's melting, I love multitasking when we're cooking. You wanna start one thing and move into another. Cooking is about this kind of fluid motion, it's about multitasking, and the better that you get at it, and the only way that you get better is through practice, through taking classes, looking up recipes, and practice, 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 the better that you get, the more that you can do at once. I know a lot of times when my family sees me cook, they're like, wow, what takes us two days to cook, you do in two hours. And I'm like, well, I've been doing this for like 25 years. I hope that I can cook a little bit faster than the rest. Um, but that just comes with a ton of practice and uh, really great multitasking skills. Um, so what I did to the shallot, is I cut it in half, I left the root on, the root is what's gonna hold it together. So I'm just gonna pull back all of that garbage, we don't need it, and we're gonna keep the shallot in half, and we're gonna basically brunoise the shallot. Very, very simple uh, knife skill, but one that you need to practice, okay? I always say with knife skills, people ask all the time, how do I get better at cutting shallots? How do I get better at cutting onions? How do I get better at cu cutting anything, really? And I'm like, listen, there's no way around it. The only way you get better is through practice. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna slice the shallot down lengthwise, and then we're gonna cut the shallot through the center, and then we're just gonna bring our knife down slowly and it's gonna make perfect little brunoise pieces. Now, if they're not perfect, that's okay because this is going into the filling, uh, which is essentially another word for the filling is farce, right? Fancy word, you guys can throw around with your friends every once in a while and be like, oh, the farce that I made for my squash blossoms is essentially just filling. It's gonna hide under all of that crab, under all of that cheese. So don't worry too much if the knife skills aren't perfect. So I just went lengthwise, you can see that, and then just sort of through the center, and I'm gonna hold the shallot and just bring my knife slowly down. I'm letting my knife do the work. I'm not really pressing. You wanna have a sharp knife because a sharp knife doesn't really require to press down. It's gonna do the job for you. I think more people get hurt using a dull knife than they do a sharp knife. We wanna go basically all the way to the root, and this is all of the shallot there. And that's only one half of the shallot. We're gonna do the same thing with the other half of the shallot. So again, just all the way through. The cuts are very nice and even, just like that. And then right through the center ever so gently. And then letting the knife do the work for you, slicing through those perfect pieces of shallot. Oh, got a little teary on that one. That's okay, it happens every so often. Whew. Okay, so I've got the butter in here. It's just starting to soften. It's melted, we're good. We're gonna continue, I've got all those shallots and we're going to just open up a couple of cloves of garlic and chop those up and add it to the shallot. And then we will start the base of this filling. 
So you can buy a peeled garlic. I'm absolutely into peeled garlic all day long. I think it's a great time saver. It's a great product found in the produce section. It is, uh, you know, they're in these little tiny cryovacked containers. I like the ones that are cryovacked in little groups, right? So maybe it's six or seven grouped together because usually you want about six or seven cloves of garlic per recipe. I think that's a good number. When you see a whole container of garlic that's cryovacked and then you open it, they don't stay as fresh um, as long. So you wanna try and find garlic if it is peeled in these little like kind of like super small packets that you guys can use. Um, I would say please do not use a minced garlic. I don't really love minced garlic. I think it really changes the flavor of your dish. I know that it's a great time-saving tool, but I do think that you suffer in flavor and in quality. Um, if I ever do find a great product of a pre-minced garlic, I will let you all know, but I have not found one to date. Um, so there is a little stem. Um, a little root on garlic that you can trim off. If you start to see it discolored, it's fine. But we're gonna chop this so fine that that root is just gonna kinda disappear through the chopping of the garlic. You're not really gonna notice it. No one's ever gonna find it and it's totally safe to eat and I just think that it's a great time saver. Okay, so the garlic and shallots are together. We're gonna just take this pan of melted butter which is right here. I've stopped crying, so nobody worry at home. And I'm just gonna go ahead and pour that shallot and garlic right into that butter. I'm gonna hit it with a little bit of salt. So we've got the shallots and garlic just sort of warming in some melted butter. We don't want it to get any color. You don't want them to caramelize. You don't want them to brown. You just want them to be soft and translucent. You wanna be able to see through the shallot, see through the garlic, okay? And that's just kind of bringing out the natural flavor. So when it's inside the stuffing, you taste the beautiful flavors of shallot and garlic, not sort of the aggressive flavors of them being raw. So we're gonna do ricotta. Put that back. Okay, so I like to add all of the cheese and the herbs and the lemon zest before I add the crab. And that's because I am trying to keep the crab as, as lumped as possible, right? We bought a beautiful lump crab, so I really wanna make sure that the crab stays as whole as possible um, and not necessarily, you know, shred throughout. I'd like to be able to keep some of those nice pieces of lump. Okay. Now, the cheese is cold, right? The mascarpone specifically, you know, has a toughness to it. So it's nice to have them at room temperature, but what's really gonna help this melt is gonna be that hot butter with shallots and garlic. That is what's gonna break up this farce, this stuffing, so that you can just fold in the crab later. So even if this cheese feels a little cold right now, that's okay because we've got warm butter and garlic that's gonna go over the top, that's gonna soften this and help us loosen it up, okay? So we're gonna put some lemon zest. And when I zest lemons, I take the rasper and the lemon in my hand, okay? Not like this but like this, it feels more natural. And I just go from top to bottom. You know, a lot of times you see people like going back and forth like it's a violin. You don't need to. Just top to bottom, just like that, all the way around, moving your hand in a counterclockwise direction so that the lemon moves with it. And then over in a pat, and I move on to my other lemon, bringing the rasper from the top down to the bottom, top down to the bottom. I love using zest so much from lemons. It has that really beautiful, you know, the oil of the lemon, the actual essence of the lemon versus the sourness of the lemon. So we don't need these anymore. We'll put the rasper away. And we will start on our herbs. Okay, so tarragon and chives. I love chives. It's like one of my favorite herbs. It is just so good. It's got that really just strong onion flavor. Add some green as well, um, but it's just got such a strong onion flavor. So we're gonna throw the chives in there and then tarragon. 
I think tarragon and crab just go so well together. And especially in this application, right? We're cooking for the Feast of Seven Fish. It's an Italian American tradition. The, the flavor of fennel or anise or licorice that is kind of reminiscent of that Italian cooking comes from tarragon. So I think this is a great herb. Yes, you can use basil, but I really feel that anise flavor that, that tarragon has is a perfect addition of herb to this. So the tarragon, okay? It's kind of weedy looking if you think about it, right? There's these pieces that are like looped in by other little strands that go, right? You just kind of want to pull it and then pull the top. You do need to be careful for the top when you pull those herbs because these stems we don't want to eat. We don't want to eat really any of the stem of the tarragon. It's just too much. Now, tarragon is an herb. And I'm, I mean, obviously it's an herb. Obviously it's an herb. When I'm saying it like that, I'm like, it's an herb, it is strong. It is, when it comes and knocks at your door, it's not like a little tap, 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 maybe like basil or thyme. It like pounds on your door. So you wanna use it sparingly. You don't wanna go crazy with it. You don't want it to be the only thing that people taste. And unfortunately, sometimes that's what happens with tarragon. People are like, oh, there's something really strong in there and I don't know what it is. It's usually tarragon. So you have to use it wisely. And by wisely, just, you know, very sparingly, one or two tablespoons, just so that it enhances the dish. We're looking for that fennel, anise, licorice flavor that it brings. Um, so we're just gonna do a quick once over and a chop. And then we will add both of these herbs to the mixture. I'm gonna give it a little mix on its own and try and get it going by just hitting it against the side of the bowl with a rubber spatula. And then I'm gonna go in with my hot butter, with the shallots and the garlic in it, and that's what's really gonna help break this up. And remember too, the crab is sort of naturally salty on its own, right? This is already picked blue crab, I'm sorry, this is already picked crab. So we also wanna keep this butter in there, that's great, okay? The butter, once this gets cold, is actually gonna help firm up all of the mixture, okay? So it may seem like it's a little soft right now and you're like, oh my goodness, how am I gonna mix this inside of um, a squash blossom? How am I gonna get to stay? It's not gonna stay right now because this is a little too soft, but once this all mixes together, and gets cold, that butter is actually gonna harden again and it's gonna be perfect to stuff it inside of the blossom. Let me give it a little taste. Mm -hmm. It's ready for salt and pepper. So a little bit of salt. And just add a little bit of cracked black pepper. Then once all that's mixed together, then we're gonna add our crab. Now, this is a mix because the Feast of Seven Fishes is obviously a bounty of fish for dinner, for your Christmas Eve dinner this great Italian American tradition. There's a lot of cooking that goes into that night. So these kinds of things you can do ahead of time. This crab mixture, I would say you could make the day before. It'll sit, it'll get nice and firm. You can even fill your squash flowers and let them sit the day before as well, and then just fry them the day of so that you can enjoy your day with everyone else. Um, but it's really important to really think about the things that you can do ahead of time to get done so that on day of Christmas Eve morning, you're not inundated with making this bounty all in one day. So when you're folding crab into the cheese mixture, you know, you don't wanna go back and forth like that. That's gonna break up the crab. You wanna go from top and then scoop the bottom and bring the bottom up to the top. So I'm kind of doing this circular motion, right? So I'm, I'm rotating the bowl, I'm scooping the crab in the mixture from top to bottom, top to bottom. The circular motion, it's what's gonna allow the crab to kind of mingle with the herbs and the lemon and the shallots and the garlic and the cheese without breaking up and we're still gonna be able to keep those lump pieces of crab. I'm gonna go ahead and just give us a taste. So good. You can still taste the subtle flavors of crab. It's so sweet and tastes like the ocean. 
Um, but for me, it's the tarragon and lemon that make this entire dish. So this mixture needs to cool for about 15 minutes. So why don't you all just press pause for 15 minutes, let it get nice and cold, and then I'll meet you right back here. All right, we are back, everyone. We have a nice cold crab mix, and we are ready to stuff our squash flowers. Okay, so squash flowers. Now, here's the thing. They seem like they are so delicate, and they are, but they hold so much flavor. They, um, you're able to stuff them with so many different types of ingredients. Trust me, I have done it and tried it. Um, and they really hold up. They are an incredible vessel to any kind of stuffing that you wanna deep fry. Um, and I just think that they are so beautiful first and foremost, but they are strong. They are beautiful and strong. Um, and there's a couple different ways. So basically the flour is what is attached to your squash, okay? They separate them. Sometimes you'll see them with a tiny little baby squash on the end and those are so adorable. Um, and then there is a little sort of flowering bud in the center. I am not into taking those out. A lot of people say that you need to take those out. For me, the entire flower is edible. But what I do like to do is trim the bottom. So I like to take some kitchen shears. You can use a knife, but I like to just kind of trim the bottom a little bit on a bias so that there's just a little bit of, a, of an interesting cut, if you will, to the end of the squash. We can leave the little end of the squash. We can eat that, it'll be delicious. But as it gets a little longer, it becomes a little more fibrous and that is not so great. Uh, and what I like to say, listen, yes, I work in a restaurant. I have a couple of restaurants here in Los Angeles. So yes, it's easy for me to get these kinds of ingredients. But what I always like to teach people when I'm mentoring and talking about how to cook at home and what we do is Become friends with everyone at your local supermarket, whether it's your fishmonger, whether it's your butcher, whether it's your cheesemonger, and the produce manager, okay? Every purveyor that sells to restaurants sells to supermarkets. So you really are able to get any of these ingredients. Um, and then honestly, I've had squash flowers shipped to me online, so there's also those options. But just know that especially around the holidays, everyone's always looking to help. They know that their customers are looking for specialty ingredients, so all you need to do is ask. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is actually create the little stuffing rounds, if you will. So I use a tablespoon just to kind of scoop it out and it's a little bit over a tablespoon and I like to kind of mold them into the shape of the squash. So that way, once they're molded, they kind of just slip right in. So I like to do that ahead of time so that I can wash my hands and then just work a little bit more gently with the squash, not really worrying about the, squ the outside of the squash getting the crab mixture. So we're just gonna go, and that's why it's so important for this mix to get nice and cold, and that's why I suggested, I mean, absolutely do it the day before so it gets nice and hard. And that's just so that the crab itself is more pliable, it's easier to work with, it's not getting stuck to your hands. When you have a really cold product, it'll work like that. When you have a less cold product, unfortunately, you're at the mercy of the mix. Okay, we're gonna put this off to the side. So now that we have all our little crab uh, oval discs, I guess you can call them, we are ready to stuff. And what I'm gonna do is actually just open up the squash from the top a little bit, okay? Make a little peep hole, if you will. Gonna put the crab inside like so, okay? Just kind of nestle it in there all the way to the base. And then I just like to kind of cover the top with 
the rest of the flour. And it's okay if there's a little bit of crab coming out. You remember, these are gonna get battered. There's gonna be a whole batter that goes along, okay? So again, just open the squash. Now, if the squash, some we are really small, some are very, very large, right? So we'll have to adjust our mix depending on the size of the squash, right? So I might just take half of the mix for this one because he's a little bit smaller. He was a straggler. He was the runt of the litter. That's okay, we still love him. We're still gonna eat him or her. <laughs> Just put it in there just like that. And then we have the larger blossom, just like this. Right in the center. And then you see what I'm doing here. I have a little towel just to the right of me. So I have one clean hand. This hand never touches any of the stuffing. That is just for the squash. I open the squash. I keep it open there. I use this hand to grab stuffing, right? I put it into the squash. I will need both hands though to fill it. So I just kind of wipe the residue of filling that comes off very quickly because the mix is nice and cold. One hand here and then here, okay? Then we just kind of use the flour to open up and to close. And again, that little bud in the center, some people are a little bit more particular about it. I am not, okay? Not at all. I really just enjoy all of the squash. It's a vegetable and the whole thing is edible. And this is exactly what you wanna see from the squash, right? Because the mix is nice and cold, because I'm only using one hand to touch the mix and then I'm wiping it on my towel, you don't see mix on the outside of the flour. Okay, we are gonna let these flowers go back into the fridge and let them get nice and firm for another couple of minutes while we make the tempura batter mix. Okay. And again, these flowers can be stuffed a day in advance. So you can make the crab mixture in the morning, the day before Christmas Eve, the day before the feast of the seven fishes. Um, and then later in the day, maybe you stuff all your squash flowers, right? And then you just fry them day of. Because the squash flowers can stay stuffed in your refrigerator for just one day, just one day. Anything more than one day, they're gonna get too wet and they're not gonna survive. And that's what I mean when I say that the squash flower is beautiful and durable. Because I mean, look at this. I mean, this is a delicate flower. And now I'm taking this very sort of rich, cheesy, crabby mix and putting it in there. And it's like, yep, don't worry, I got you. Okay, so I have all my squash flowers stuffed with that beautiful crab mixture. I'm gonna pop them back in the fridge for a couple of minutes while we make our tempura batter. It is tempura batter making time. Uh, tempura batter, very, very, very easy group of ingredients. It's essentially just flour, rice flour, cornstarch, baking powder, salt, and a little bit of sparkling water. Can you use a soda water? Absolutely. I've got a little fancy Italian sparkling water because, hey, we're Italian all day today. So I've just got a little bit of all-purpose flour, AP flour. I'm gonna take a measuring cup, and we're gonna just do one cup of flour. This is all equal parts. One cup of flour, one cup of rice flour, one cup of cornstarch. So you can really remember this batter for any grouping, depending on how much you wanna make, because it's all equal parts. Rice flour, and a little, some cornstarch. The cornstarch is what really, really, really creates that crispy, crispy texture. So even though it seems like a lot of cornstarch, I promise you, it is worth it. And the other thing with this batter, it's not really baking. So you see me kind of grabbing the flour and grabbing the cornstarch and just kind of pouring it in. It isn't this perfect measured, um, it isn't this perfect measured in a measuring cup, kind of take a knife and cut it off, because it's a batter. So it's a little off here and there. It's not really gonna make a difference, I promise. So we got one tablespoon of baking powder and we also have a tablespoon of salt. 
I've got all of my dry ingredients in a bowl, and now we're just gonna whisk in some sparkling water. And then I'm gonna show you how I was taught to test my tempura batter, which I still find to this day hilarious. Um, the reason we're using a sparkling water in tempura is that it really has an opportunity to break up all of the flour mixture. We can always add more water. We obviously can't take any away. So we'll test one and then we'll see what happens, okay? So I was taught, and I'm gonna show you right now, we're gonna take this out and put it in the sink. I was always taught to dip a portion of my hand into the batter so that you can kind of see how the batter flows off of your hand and then you can kind of test its thickness. So you do this. And I would say actually right now that is a little too thick. So I might add a little bit more water, but we're gonna test one of our squash flowers first. So um, I've got my fryer at 350 right now. We've got the cold crab stuffed squash flowers and the batter's ready to go. Okay, so I wanna do one hand into the batter and the other hand is so that I can just sort of flip the squash flowers with my tongs. So no two hands in the batter, we wanna keep one free. So I'm gonna dip, make sure everything is coated. I'm gonna let it drain off. I'm gonna put the squash into the fryer. And I don't wanna overcrowd the pot at all. I really wanna make sure that there's an opportunity for them to get nice and brown and they're gonna take just seconds to cook because the crab in the center is already cooked. We just wanna warm it and we just want the batter to get nice and brown. Okay, so that's about half the squash flowers into that batter and right into the fryer. I'm gonna let them fry on one side and then we're gonna just start to flip them over. And they really only take about three or four minutes in this fryer. because again, the batter is already, it's really just about crisping the batter and warming the inside of the squash flour. I'm gonna have some salt ready to go because as soon as these guys come out of the fryer, I'm gonna put them onto a sheet tray with a little bit of paper towels. We're gonna season them with salt and that's when the salt can really, that's when the squash flour can really accept the salt is when it comes right out of the fryer. So there is always the occasional exploding squash flour that, you set, that usually has to do with the fact that the batter hasn't fully coated and that there's an air pocket somewhere. So if you wanna always test one, you test a squash. I dip it a couple of times, like one, two, three. Really make sure it's dipped, then I put it into the fryer, um, and then you have less of a chance of, it, of exploding. Um, but these look pretty good right now. If they do explode, you wanna pull them right out of the fryer immediately. Take any of the carnage, any, any of the filling that may have come out um, and just kind of start over. You wanna make sure there's nothing left in there. But it's really about making sure that everything is evenly coated on that squash flour. And really, the use of the cornstarch in this batter is gonna really prevent you from having an exploding squash flour because the cornstarch, I think, is like the best glue there is. So we got the first batch out. We're gonna just do a little bit of salt. I like to say when we do salt, you put it between three fingers, your thumb, your pointer finger, and your middle finger, and you just rub back and forth so those salt particles get everywhere. It's not just in one area. They're looking good. Okay, off to the second batch. So again, 
really making sure that this squash flour is coated, it drips right into the fryer. Um, and what I was saying before is you wanna make sure that this batter is kind of always being mixed. So I'm doing that with my hand. I'm not scared of getting my hand into that batter, really feeling the batter coat the squash flour. This hand is totally free in case I need the tongs. I'm only battering with one hand. I'm also battering pretty close to the fry pot so that I'm not making a huge mess by dragging the drippings across any kind of stove top or anything like that. There will be some casualties. You will 100% see some drippings. There will be a little bit of cleanup, but you try and keep it as minimal as possible by keeping the batter a little closer to the fryer. Another thing too, is that before you turn these squash flowers, before they have an opportunity to turn, you can uh, just kind of toss a little oil on top of the, of the blossom that hasn't been touched by oil yet. I'll show you what that looks like right now. So I just kind of take a spoon, and then before these blossoms are ready to touch, I just throw a little bit of oil on the other side that hasn't been kissed by oil yet to make sure that there's no opportunity for exploding squash flour. Now, I'm sure you've seen maybe some other chefs do this sort of sway back and forth with their squash flour so that the top of the flour kind of blossoms to come out. I don't do this with this mixture because I really want to make sure that the top stays closed. I think it's just safer that way. So we're going to forfeit the flowering part of the squash so that we make sure that we have blossoms that are fully cooked um, and that the, the filling really stays in there. But if you feel them right now, the best part of this batter is the cornstarch, I'm telling you. I know it seems like a lot of cornstarch, but it works, it makes it nice and crispy. So even as I'm touching these blossoms inside of the fryer, I can feel their crispy outside texture. So I'm so excited to eat them because when you eat a blossom, you've got that crispy texture, this delicate blossom. And I haven't even gotten to the crab part yet of the crab and the tarragon and the lemon. It's like three layers of goodness in this little bite. So again, it's really just like a couple of minutes until there's golden brown because the crab is already cooked. The blossom takes seconds. So it's really just a matter of getting that batter nice and crispy. So I wanna make sure I know what flowers just came out so we can season them. Perfect. Just do a little bit of salt. Again, wave your fingers back and forth so that the salt particles lay evenly on there, they are ready to go. So with the squash flowers, this is definitely a dish that you eat right away, okay? This isn't a dish that can hang out for a while, unfortunately, because it is fried. So just think about that when you're doing it in batches. Maybe it's just kind of something that you have at the beginning of the night that people can munch on because it's not really something that can sit around for a while. Very rarely do I make those kinds of dishes, but this dish is so special, it's okay. You're gonna wanna fry them to order. And then I just take a little platter and I get ready to plate them and there's nothing, I don't like to any frills, any whistles, any extra herbs. I don't like to do any of that. I really just enjoy the flour being the star of the plate because they're just so beautiful. I mean, look at that. They're so beautiful and so strong. They hold up to this frying. They hold up to this crab mixture. Oh, so, so, so good. Kind of arrange them like a flower, right? Looks like a beautiful little flower all the way around. Maybe do a couple like here in the center. Just kind of nuzzled on one another. I can't wait to try these bad boys. Woo, so good. Okay, this is my favorite part ever. This is the part where I get to eat all the squash flowers and just tell you about them. 
And I know, sometimes I just go whole squash flour in my mouth. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to be a lady. These are legitimately my favorite thing on the planet. There should be a food group just on its own. It's just so good. Um, where do I start? The crunch, first and foremost. So much texture from that batter, that cornstarch in that batter, that crunch, crunch, crunch. And the flour is so delicate, but it just kind of tears away. And then you get to the crab. And I got in my first bite, this beautiful lump crab, this beautiful piece of lump crab that's seasoned with tarragon is what I taste next. So there's this anise licorice flavor that kind of comes to the front of the to the front of the bite that then is like, hey, what about me, lemon? And there's this kind of bright lemony flavor that goes with it, that goes so, so, so well with the crab. It's just a perfect bite. Mm.